for a better understanding of the world around you, for a greater knowledge of the world you live in. Wolf and Dessauer in downtown Fort Wayne and downtown Huntington brings the Screen News Digest, a chapter of living history, into your classroom. Nineteen sixty three, the United Nations General Assembly meets in New York in mankind's pursuit of peace in our time and for all time. Another milestone on a troubled journey begun long ago and far away. A dream will become an idea. An idea will become a declaration. A declaration will become the basis for an organization of United Nations. Newfoundland Coast, August 1941. Franklin Roosevelt meets in secret with Winston Churchill. It is Britain's darkest hour, yet here in the Atlantic Charter is born the dream of a United Nations. All men in all lands living in freedom from fear and want. The Barton Oaks, outside Washington, 1944. World War II still rages, but representatives of America, England, Russia, plan for peace. We meet at a time when the war is moving toward an overwhelming triumph for the forces of freedom. It is our task here to help lay the foundations upon which, after victory, peace, freedom, and a growing prosperity may be built for generations to come. June 1945. San Francisco becomes the capital of the world. Victory in Europe is won. The war against Japan soon will be ended. And representatives of 51 nations come to the Memorial Opera House to write and to ratify the charter of a permanent international agency a United Nations organization with power and authority to prevent and halt future aggression. Secretary of State Stettinius presides over the historic deliberations that bring forth an instrument of high purpose, an institution of great promise, the United Nations. Its operations are divided into six principal agencies. A General Assembly, a Security Council, an Economic and Social Council, a Trusteeship Council, an International Court of Justice, and a Secretariat. The General Assembly meeting each year is the conscience of the United Nations, the place where all nations, large and small, can speak up and be heard. The Security Council meeting monthly is the primary guardian of world peace and security. There are five permanent members, the United States, France, Great Britain, Russia, and China, plus six other countries elected for two-year terms. The Economic and Social Council, made up of 18 members elected for three years, serves the underdeveloped nations of the world in countless places and ways, pooling the research and the resources of the have nations to help enrich the lives and the future of the have-nots. The 
Trusteeship Council, although little known, is perhaps one of the most important UN agencies, for its job is helping prepare territories and areas for the day when they will become independent and take their place as members of the United Nations. The International Court of Justice is the UN's judicial arm and its 15 members are elected for nine-year terms by the General Assembly. The court hears and passes judgment on specific cases involving UN members. If any country fails to obey a court ruling, the Security Council can step in and take action against that nation. The Secretariat, headed by the Secretary General, directs the day-to-day -day operations of the United Nations, a vast and complex network that employs some 14,000 men and women representing 103 nationalities and serving in 106 countries. Night and day, each and all are just a telephone call away from UN headquarters in New York. And so in 1945, its foundations laid, its framework established, the United Nations begins its pursuit of peace. Within a year, roadblocks will appear. In its very first case, the Security Council hears a complaint by Iran that Russia has refused to withdraw red occupation troops from Iranian soil. Soviet delegate Gromyko rejects the complaint and wartime allies become peacetime antagonists as Secretary of State Burns says, All that is now contemplated is the adoption of an agenda which would give to the Iranian government an opportunity to present facts which, in the opinion of that government, constitute a threat to international peace. Nine of the 11 Security Council members support Secretary Burns and his resolution. But under the terms of the Charter, all five permanent members must agree. And so a Russian no means instant defeat. Nine against two. There is no abstention. I consider that the proposal is rejected since one of the permanent members of the Security Council voted against such proposal. The United Nations and the world have been introduced to the power of the veto. Nineteen forty-six, America is the world's only atomic power, possessing the most awesome weapon man has ever created. Seeking to prevent a nuclear arms race, the United States has Bernard Baruch present an atomic disarmament plan based on international control and inspection. We propose this. One manufacture of atomic bombs shall stop. Two existing bombs shall be disposed of pursuant to the terms of the treaty. <coughs> and three, the authorities shall be in possession of full information as to the know-how for the production of atomic knowledge. The bomb does not wait upon debate. But Andrei Gromyko will disagree. Russia will debate. And an atomic test ban will not be signed for 17 years. 1950. Nationalist China has been driven off the mainland. And the Security Council's refusal to recognize Communist China triggers another dramatic act of Soviet defiance against the United Nations. Russian delegate Jakub Malik walks out and his country begins a seven-month boycott of the Security Council. The Soviet Union cannot know it, but this action will enable the United Nations to act quickly, decisively, in one of its greatest and gravest crises. June 1950. South Korea is invaded, and the Security Council, with Russia still absent, names General MacArthur commander-in-chief of a UN army created to aid the embattled little land. Sixteen countries, 
send troops to fight and to die on the slopes of Korea. 48 other nations contribute equipment and strategic supplies. After three years and 200,000 American and UN casualties, the fighting comes to an end in 1953 when an armistice agreement is signed at Panmunjom. The communist North Koreans have been kept north of the 38th parallel. The independence and integrity of South Korea and the United Nations has been preserved. Middle East, October 1956. Israeli troops invade Egypt, and within a week, England and France intervene. While army units wait ashore, the clouds of war, black and menacing like those over the city, threaten to envelop the world. While the fighting rages, the United Nations acts. The Security Council, with America and Russia voting together, establishes an international police force to end the fighting and keep the peace. Thirteen days after the start of the Israeli invasion, the first units of the United Nations Emergency Force land in the Suez Canal Zone. The troops are the first peace-preserving units in the history of the United Nations. Once again, the world is spared the horror of an all-out nuclear war. But crisis is to quickly follow crisis. And almost at once, the United Nations is called upon to act. The new crisis, Soviet Russia's ruthless suppression of the Hungarian revolt in 1956. For seven frantic days in November, Hungary is free. Then as Russia uses her veto power to paralyze effective Security Council action, Soviet forces crush the revolt and stamp out Hungary's short-lived independence. A last fateful message marks the death of a dream. God save our souls. When the General Assembly is asked to vote on a resolution to condemn the Soviet intervention, Russia is on trial before the world. The roll call will begin with Israel. Israel, yes. Italy, yes. Jordan, abstain. Laos, yes. Lebanon, yes. Liberia, yes. Libya, yes. Luxembourg, yes. Soviet Union, no. United Kingdom, yes. 56 in favor, 8 against, and 13 abstentions. The draft resolution is adopted. Russia stands condemned, but for Hungary, it is too little, too late. The Congo, July 1960. Independence brings chaos and the infant republic appeals to the United Nations for help. Action is swift as the UN authorizes a police force to help restore order. Troops from 18 nations, mostly African, are flown into the troubled Congo. But the action is criticized by Russia and the UN is plunged into the gravest crisis in its history. The very existence of the organization is at stake as Premier Nikita Khrushchev himself comes to New York to press for the resignation of Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld. Khrushchev demands a three-man troika, with each man having veto power, as he bitterly denounces the UN and its officers. Представителям государств здесь заседающих, почему, когда вы This jerk, this uh stooge of American imperialism here, who is speaking before you, he is touching upon questions which uh, are obviously not procedural ones, and the uh, president who is sympathizing with these uh, colonialists and colonial domination obviously is not stopping him 
Is that justice? Mr. President, we live on earth not by the grace of God and not by your grace, sir, but the force and the strength of our great Soviet people. With quiet courage, the Secretary General answers the Soviet Premier. It is very easy to resign. It is not so easy to stay on. It is very easy to bow to the wish of a big power. It is another matter to resist. By resigning, I would therefore, at the present, difficult and dangerous juncture, throw the organization to the winds. I have no right to do so. I shall remain in my post during the term of my office as a servant of the organization in the interest of all those other nations as long as they wish me to do so. The sea of applause drowns out the desk pounding Khrushchev. The United Nations has seen its finest hour and has shown the world that it serves no single master and is slave to no single nation. From 51 countries in 1945, the United Nations has grown to 111 members in 1963. Its programs of social, economic and cultural assistance and exchange have reached out to touch and improve the lives of millions and tens of millions of people. Much has been done, and much still remains to be done. The dream of all men in all lands living in freedom from fear and want has not yet come true. But the United States continues to believe in and to work for that dream. And so in 1963, President Kennedy pledges anew America's faith and support in the United Nations. Mr. Secretary General, delegates to the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, we meet again in the quest for peace. We have the power to make this the best generation of mankind in the history of the world, or to make it the last. The science of weapons and war has made us all, far more than 18 years ago in San Francisco, one world and one human race with one common destiny. The United Nations, building on its successes and learning from its failures, must be developed into a genuine world security system. My fellow inhabitants of this planet, let us take our stand here in this assembly of nations and let us see that if we, in our own time, can move the world to a just and lasting peace, in 1963, the United Nations looked back on 18 troubled and not always successful years. But it remains today as it was on its founding day, a beacon of promise, beckoning mankind forward in pursuit of peace. To widen your horizons, to stimulate your interest in things going on about you. Wolf and Dessau, one of America's great department stores, has presented the Screen News Digest as a public service.